Welcome to the Mental Insights Podcast. This is your host, Brennan Catulli, and we are here today for episode number 41 with Maxwell Ivy. Max is a good friend of mine that I have grown to know over throughout the past few months. Max is a 49-year-old blind gentleman who grew up in a family of carnival owners. Through many of his family footsteps from their family business to their environment, Maxwell began to learn what was the best steps to move forward for his own life. Through many trials and tribulations, Max realized that he needed to make his own pathway for his life. He then created his own site, the Midway Marketplace, to sell amusement equipment online. This then led to him starting his own blog to promote his own personal story after he heard how much of an inspiration he was. Max then started the blindblogger.net to promote his own life story, to speak about some of the inspiration that he can provide, but as well to truly transform the fields that he is passionate about and help others within their journey to success to share their own insightful information that they want out there. Max serves many clients through being a publicist and as well he has created some exceptional connections throughout the online community to help promote, to help bring awareness and just to connect and inspire many people throughout our society today. I consider Max a great friend and one who truly is out there to do good within the world. Max shares some truly honest remarks about his own life, some of the challenges that he faced, and really what brought him the perspective to make a positive change within his life. Max is truly a profound inspiration to not only myself, but many people online and in society today. So please tune in to this conversation with Max Ivy for episode number 41 of the Mental Insights podcast. Please share any insights or anything that you want to share with your friends that you might enjoy within this episode. I thank you all for listening. Welcome to the Mental Insights Podcast. This is your host, Brennan Catulli, and we are here today for the 42nd guest of the Mental Insights Podcast, Maxwell Ivy. Max, thank you for taking this time out with me today. I'm so excited to dive deep within your own work and just about health and, and where we are today in general. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, this is going to be a little bit different than the conversations I usually have just because of the topic of your show, but I'm looking forward to seeing some, some new questions and hopefully finding out a little something about myself along the way. I really look forward to it and, and I appreciate your honesty and I think we'll definitely be able to uh, uncover some uh, insights we may not have known uh, yesterday or even earlier today. So I'm excited for it. And the first question I like to ask my guests and then before we truly unravel your own story and what you're offering people today within our society is, you know, when did you first learn about the importance of mental health and just how that can play a role within, you know, not only yourself, but just society in general? Well, I think I'm like a lot of people. My understanding of mental health came after I had gone through some depression and some, some bad times and gotten better. And then after you're, you're through the crisis, if you're, if you're, if you're smart or if you've got good friends, you start thinking about the, about, well, how did that happen? Why did it happen? What can I learn from it that I can use later in life? Because as we all know, just because you've gone through one really bad experience doesn't mean that there isn't another one out there for you somewhere. There's a, a old Japanese proverb that says, after a victory, tighten your helmet cord, which basically means if you've come through a severe struggle and you think everything is great, that doesn't mean that there is another enemy down the road. So uh, I've discovered the importance of mental health and health and good health in general after uh, my father died in 2003. My family tried to keep our small carnival going for a while in 
2006 or seven, we realized we weren't going to be able to do it. So we had to combine our rides with my, with my uncle and his family's show. And to make people understand this, growing up, we lived on the same property. We were in the same business. We competed with each other very bitterly, bitterly to the point that, you know, once the, the answering machine tape from our house disappeared and mail would turn up, un, turn up already open. That's sort of family competition. You know, you can only do that stuff with people you're related to, you know. Um, so when we decided we had to join up with somebody, I didn't realize it at the time, but I know now it's like, come on, if we had to lose, why did we have to lose to them? Because... <laughs> You know, it's like we're out, we're done. You know, like the game of Monopoly. At the end, there's one person that's a winner. Well, my uncle and his family, they were the winners. And it's like, why do we have to lose to them? Isn't there somebody else we could join up with? Um, but, you know, it's my mom was making the decisions. Um, my uncle is her youngest brother. And so we did that. But I realized that, um, so at that same time, um, I'm not happy. I'm on another guy's midway. Uh, every few months, he's, you know, telling me, well, this ride can't work no more. Or, you know, that game can't go up if you're not going to put new canvas on it. So it's like a gradual push. And so uh, I'm not feeling good about myself. I'm getting heavier and heavier. And I'm in a motel in Portland, Vaca, Texas. And uh, I peed to bed, got thrown out of the motel, well, almost thrown out of the motel, and, and was basically dragged to go see a doctor. The doctor said, you know, man, you're in bad shape. If you don't change your life soon, you're not going to be around here much longer. So I go home and I see a doctor and the doctor's first thing she realizes is that I probably have sleep apnea. So she diagnoses the apnea has, a, I have a sleep study. I start using a CPAP machine. I start getting better sleep and people don't realize how dangerous uh, lack of sleep or poor quality sleep is for you. It can, there's so many direct physical detriments that come from it, you know, um, uh, lack of energy, lack of interest, depression, uh, loss of, of passion for things you usually find enjoyable, uh, impotence, high blood pressure, even heart attack and stroke can be indirectly caused by sleep apnea. So uh, I get that and I start getting better sleep. So I start thinking more about my situation and I started, well, this ain't going to be around much longer. Sooner or later, they're going to they're either going to openly tell me to leave or they're going to do something that forces us or at least, you know, out, off the midway. So I start working on my own business, helping people sell surplus amusement equipment. And so at least I've got something that's mine, something I can do where I can focus my energy and basically just ignore the stuff that, that I'm not enjoying for a while. And eventually I was able to talk my family into letting me quit, even though they kept working and just go full time into selling uh, carnival and amusement park rides. So, you know, after I get through all of this and I'm enjoying what I'm doing, my health is so much better, I realize, Max, you weren't happy. You were depressed. Whether you were clinically diagnosed or not, you were. And uh, real, realizing the difference between me when I'm doing something I love versus me doing something I hate but I got to be there anyway is two different people. So that's my experience with uh, with the mental health and how it affects us or doesn't affect us. And I, I hope that's what you were after. It, it certainly was, Max. I, I really appreciate that honest approach. And we got a good glimpse into, you know, the transition throughout your own health and when you started to, you know, become aware of, of its importance. And, you know, I want to ask you about, you know, there's definitely was a big change within, you know, your transition from being within the business of your family and then taking ownership of your own business but what was really the the mindset change as you moved from, you know, working under your family, whether it was, you know, within their own business or the collaboration afterwards compared to working on your own and having, you know, that change of mindset within your own health and your body, but as well within your mind? Well, the first thing is when I started working on my business, I'd be working, I'd be, I'd be at work at two or three o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, I'd wake up and code because at that time I had to hand code HTML because there was no other option for a blind person to put a website online. And I didn't have the money to hire somebody or the, the confidence that if that I could turn the, turn the uh, operation of my baby over to somebody else at that point. But so, uh, you know, I was, I, I, I used to tell people, 
The last thing I think about before I go to bed is what can I do better to help my clients and customers tomorrow? And the first thing I do when I wake up is let me check my email and hope that somebody wants to buy or sell something as opposed to, as opposed to when I was working on the midway is like, okay, Max, we're going to open in a half hour. I'm like, my game's ready. Why do I have to be there a half hour early? You know, uh, you know, Max, why aren't you calling everybody in? I'm like, well, if they get close enough for me to hear them, I am asking every, everyone if they want, but they're just not getting here. You know, it was like, I got this. I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, the expression checked out. I had checked out, you know, a long time. Um, and, and one of the things that happened was my, the last game I had wasn't making any money to the point. It wasn't even paying for its own, its own stock. The, the prizes that went in the game and this was how I finally convinced my family that they could that I could go home and they could keep working I said look does it make any sense for you to have to take money out of your food trailer to buy stock for a game that make money to pay its own bills and that was like you know that was the final thing so that was the big difference I wanted to be there for this for selling equipment and now for the the writing and the podcasting and other stuff I really didn't care whether I was there or not for the I mean um, I played an event one year where my ankle was sore and when my fa- when my dad was alive and it was our business and, you know, we were building the business. If I had a sore ankle, I'd have went to the midway and worked. I would have set up a ride or helped tear down a ride on that ankle. But I'm on my, on my uncle's midway. My ankle hurt. I'm like, can somebody get me some ice? I'm not going today. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it, Max. And it, it definitely gives a, a good, honest approach to, you know, the, the different things that you were facing throughout each business. And you can see how, while you were able to transition to your own business, you had more opportunities to do things that you truly loved. You know, you spoke a little bit about doing the podcast, you know, being, being more integrated within the online community. And why don't you speak about you know, what really inspired you to start the blindblogger.net and really try to share your own passions, your own stories throughout your life? All right, well, I will do that. But first, I just want to mention that um, one of the things that I get comments on either good or, or bad is my honesty in interviews. And I have people who are like, Max, I wish I had that courage. I wish I could be that open. And then I have other people usually quote coaches or quote experts who are like, Max, you know, we, I understand your brand is honesty and authenticity, but couldn't you be, you know, make, couldn't you focus on only sharing positive experiences? And I tell people, well, that wouldn't work for me or the person listening because the, the one of the biggest problems we got going nowadays is Facebook and social media and this whole idea that everybody else's lives are amazing and my life is crap. Exactly. So, you know, so I just wanted to get that in there first, but then as far as the, the online community, I didn't actually do that. What happened was a friend of mine started a new website called aha-now.com. I mentioned it because um, Harlena Singh is a very important moment in my, in my blogging and podcasting evolution. And I believe in, in paying people back who've been helpful to me. I, I consider it a gratitude exercise. So I want to mention, she started a new website. She said, Max, I'm creating a blogging community. Um, I'd love it if you test it out. Let me know how, how, how it runs when you're using a screen reader. So I go to the website and I should mention that she was going to give away the opportunity to do guest posts once a month to whoever was the most active on her site. So I, I go to the site, I create a profile, I connect, connect with some of the people or friend them or whatever you want to call it. I wrote some, I posted some stuff and I basically just went around the website, tried it all out. It turns out I won the very first guest post and then middle of the night because she's in India, I'm in Houston, Texas. We're sending emails back and forth to create this blog post. And I think that we I finally finished it like four o'clock in the morning. She said, Max, this is good because my first post, you know, she basically had to push me to write this post and be to be as honest in it as I was. And this is four, this is five years ago, by the way, five year anniversary, just two weeks ago. Um, awesome. This is five. Yeah, it is awesome. This is five years ago. So the post ended up being titled life lessons from a blind blogger. This was before I accepted the name, the blind blogger or started the website, the And it was like, you know, Max, tell us about your journey. Some of the things you've had to learn how to do some of the things you believe in doing online. 
And I wrote that post and the post got, I don't know how many shares on social media, but it got like 125 comments. And it was just more and more of, Max, you're amazing. Max, if you can do it, what's my excuse? Max, you're inspiring. And, you know, af after this particular event, I decided, okay, I'm going to accept this role of being an inspiration. I'm going to start a second website and a second blog, which I wish I hadn't done. I wish I'd have figured out some way to make the Midway Marketplace and the Blind Blogger work together so that I would have to maintain one website because that's really just too much work. <laughs> People tried to talk me out of it. I wouldn't listen to them. Thank you, uh, Adrian Smith. I admit you were right. I was wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> but, hey, we have to laugh about that stuff, especially when, you know, there's really no way you can kill a website once you've got two of them. There's really no easy way. Um, so the, the post, I, I, um, I filed for the domain name. I started writing the post. And basically, people were encouraging me to share more of what it's like to be an entrepreneur who happens to be blind. So some of the posts still mention what I'm doing in the amusement industry. If it applies to, you know, being a positive role model and encourage role model and encouraging people to take action in their lives. So I was doing the blog. I had been doing podcast interviews for the Midway Marketplace. Uh, I've actually been doing interviews like this for over seven years now. I've done over 200. I'm not saying that to brag. It's just part of the story. And so I started to, to you know, the, so the, uh, I was doing interviews and like um, many of the hosts asked Max, when are you going to have your own podcast? And I said, well, I'll get my own podcast when I find a co-host, somebody to take care of the technical stuff. Okay, people, don't say stuff out loud that you don't want to do, okay? Because God in the universe will have a way of, of laughing at your expense and answering that question or, or solving that problem by delivering somebody perfect. So Frederick By from Canada shows up. He's looking to have a second podcast on his website. He's like, Max, sure, I'll be your coach. I'll do all that stuff. All you got to do is show up and talk or bring people on and interview them. So, you know, I've been doing that podcast for three or four years now. For a short while, it was off of, of audio because I just didn't enjoy the process of putting it out in audio, the, the uh, submission process to a free hosting platform for a podcast was just too much aggravation for me. And it was, it was killing my joy for doing interviews and sharing with people. So I went to just Facebook and YouTube for a while, but now I'm back on Apple. Um, and I've actually done something like 40 or 45 interviews, most of which nobody's ever heard because I've got 142 subscribers on YouTube. So I've got a lot of, a lot of content out there that I've recorded a lot of great interviews that I'll be sharing. And you know, I learned something about the interviews and I mentioned it in the beginning of this, of our talk here. When I interview people, I get the chance to ask them the questions I want to ask. I get the chance to learn from my guests just as much as the audience does. So it's been, been a great experience with the podcast. Um, in 2013, I was challenged to write a book as part of an online summit. Uh, Eve Quivilla, I don't know her website, but y'all can do her. She's got a really weird name. It shouldn't be hard to find her said, Max, I want you to be in a summit. You need to write a book. And I took her challenge up, even though I thought she was wrong. I got about halfway through writing, leading you out of the darkness into the light. And she said, Max, we've got four other women and they think it would be a better advertising move to have all women in the summit. I said, well, that's cool. You're talking to a carny kid, a guy who's been a promoter all his life. I understand. I understand the value of putting boots on the ground, butts in the seats, or faces behind the screen. So I was cool. I said, but I'm going to keep writing the book. Thanks to my editor, Lorraine Regulie, wordingwell.com. And uh, you've had her on the show. You know she's an amazing lady. She showed up and helped me edit and publish the book. And so 2014, that's Leading You Out came, came out. So first of three books. I'm still working on my fourth book. I'm having a little trouble uh, with that process of, of following my own advice to just pressing send and sending it off to get edited and published so people can read it and be inspired by it. But um, one of the things I tell authors all the time is it doesn't matter how many times you've published, the next one is hard. So that's the podcasting, the books. Um, public speaking started from a podcast interview where uh, Joe Pardo uh, superjoepardo.com and, and invited me after having me on his podcast, invited me to come speak in Philadelphia three years ago now. And I enjoyed it, had a great time and have been doing much more of that where I get to 
to have the personal experience of sharing my story with people, you know, where I could hear them clap, laugh, applaud, hiss, whatever. And I tell you, it is, it is a great experience to be able to get that kind of feedback because when you post to a blog or podcast, people don't always take the time or have the confidence to tell you, hey, you did really good there. So let's see. That's the blog, the podcast, the book, the speaking. Um, and I, th oh yeah. Um, because I've done so many podcasts and because I do, as you mentioned, I spend a lot of time online. I've, I've built up a pretty good community. Uh, people started asking me if I would uh, tell them how I get on podcasts. And then they started asking me if I would help them do it. And then they started asking me if they could hire me to do it. So now for, for friends and some clients, I'm what's called an online media publicist, which means I connect people with hosts and producers. So they get to do what I enjoy doing. They get to share their story. They get to let people know what they've been through and how they've come through it so they can reach a new audience and hopefully grow their passion. Okay. Do you have any time left? Cause I think I used it all up. <laughs> we got plenty of time, Max. I, I appreciate you touching on all those subjects and I'm going to make sure that we have the links towards every different media that you spoke about within the show notes so people can get accustomed to your work and check that out um, yeah. as well as the people that you have shouted out as well. We'll make sure to, to continue the, uh, the good gratitude messages throughout and uh, let people share their message. Right. I hate, I don't want people thinking I'm a shameless promoter, but it's really, it's, it's, a, it's sincere. These people have done things over the course of the last five years. They have provided, uh, they've done a lot of good things for me. Some of them done them for free, others for less than what they usually charge. Some of them have offered uh, installment plans when they don't normally let people do that. I've been blessed to have many people come along on my journey. And to me, it would be disrespecting that generosity not to say thank you in whatever way I can. And uh, for the most part, the best way I seem to be able to do that is to introduce them to other people, to let new audiences find out about them. And, uh, and really, these people, they're not, just, uh, they're not just service providers. They're not just bloggers or podcasters. They're truly amazing people. And even if you don't think you, you're going to need them in your business or your life, they're the kind of people you'd want to have in that community, those that, uh, you know, referenced in that book, the five, the five people you know or whatever it is. Some of these people should be on that list of five people. I, I really love that perspective, Max. I, I appreciate that because it, it, it is true when you're in these kinds of communities, you need to surround yourself with, you know, very, very positive and impactful people that, you know, really bring about the best within yourself and help you on, you know, some of these goals that you're really trying and aspirations that you have within your life of writing a book of, you know, having a podcast. There's so many different ways that people can assist us. And I, I'm so happy that you, you go above and beyond for other people as well. It truly, it's a testament to, you know, how compassionate and how thoughtful you are as a person. Well, thank you. I appreciate that compliment. You are so welcome, Maxwell. And I, I want to speak a little bit about you. You touched on a little bit about the transition of your health as you were going throughout the businesses, but uh, a big step within this was losing weight for you. So why don't you speak about your transition throughout your mindset and just your approach, what kind of habits and routines that you use throughout this process to, you know, lose the weight and become a healthier man uh, throughout your life and how that changed your, your own mental health as well. Right. Well, um, I, I mentioned a, a doctor and, you know, she got me to, to recognize and treat the sleep apnea. A year or two later, she said, Max, I know you're trying, but you're not making any progress. Would you, she said, I know that you don't, that you're not interested, that you have a real dim of view, dim view of, uh, of gastric surgery. I said, but would you at least uh, go listen to a seminar and hear what they have to say and do that much for me. So I went to the seminar. I was pretty much decided against them. And then the doctor, uh, one of the surgeons, I don't know if it was my surgeon uh, or not, but he starts off by saying, uh, gastric surgery is not a magic pill. It's not a something you do and you're never going to have to worry about your weight again. Gastric surgery is just one thing that you do. It's a, it's a beginning. And if you're not willing and prepared to, to do a lot of personal work, it's not going to work for you. And I'm one of these people, I'm very skeptical of anything that's easy. And I've probably passed on opportunities in my life because they look too easy. 
But if you tell me something's going to take work, I'm probably in. And so he started explaining that with gastric surgery, only 50% of the people lose 80 to 90% of the weight they need to lose and keep it off. He mentioned how some people will even gain weight, uh, especially people that have the band or, or people that cheat by taking in more of their diet from liquids. So uh, the nutritionists, they explain to us that you're going to have to, you know, uh, decrease your portion sizes, uh, change the, you know, uh, smaller meals more often, more protein, less, less simple carbohydrates, more water, ex regular exercise, no caffeine, you know, uh, a lot of things. But they, they, they always reminded us of this one important thing, and it's something we've all heard over and over again. Most of us know it, and most of us believe it, but most of us can't do it. And that is, if you do something consistently for 30 days or 25 days or whatever your, quote, guru number is, um, it becomes a habit. And once you make one thing your habit, um, for a while, then you can add other habits. So in our first meeting, they had us all pick something that we could do better for the, for the month between then and the next time they would see us. So for me, it was, it was drinking more water and having to get, uh, the equivalent of four plastic water bottles full of water a day. And, you know, even with the, the low, low calorie flavor mixers, getting that much water a day is something you have to practice. It's something you have to work at. So, uh, you, like I said, you start with one change, you continue. By the time I had my surgery, which was six months later, I had lost 81 pounds, but I knew that I had lost weight before and hadn't been able to keep it off. So I went ahead and had the surgery. Um, by, the, by 2015, which was my 50th birthday, I was down to 256 pounds. My surgeon was actually concerned I was not going to stop losing weight. Uh, they were concerned that maybe they had taken out too much because at 6'4", heavy bone structure, 260 is, is almost ugly, you know. It's, you've seen those people, they lose so much weight, they look sick, and, you know, you're like, what's wrong with them people? So on my body, 260 is almost ugly. And um, – but – uh, the other thing, you know, you have to get used to, uh, um, to your new body. And, you know, thankfully there was such a big, big difference between my starting weight and my ending weight that I didn't have any old clothes to go back to for a while. The only things I had to wear had drawstrings in them. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know, that's one of those things that, uh, that causes people to, to have relapses when they're losing weight is, is especially for people that have been overweight most of their lives is, it becomes a, a, an issue of what are you used to and comfortable with and having to get used to and accept that you're a different person now. So, you know, this is, this was, uh, let's see, February of 2012 to let's say April of 2015. That's almost three years that it took to go from 512 to 256. And with the help of gastric surgery and, you know, being able to call on a support group and uh, a nutritionist and a dietitian. And, you know, if I had, if, if absolutely necessary, even a psychologist. So that shows what, of, what of an effort. And also it shows that it was a, it was a long transition, which, you know, really helped me to accept the fact that, that I'm different or going to be different when this is over with. Thank you for sharing that, Max. I, I appreciate it. And it really shows, you know, the the determination and motivation that you had throughout that process that you didn't, you know, give up and you do want to be um, at that at that place. And, uh, you know, you made it there. And it certainly shows, you know, how much of a mindset that you needed to have to continue throughout that. And I think, you know, when you're building these habits, when you're having these routines within your life, you need to obviously have some sort of mindset or attitude to really drive you every day. And I want to ask you, you know, when you start your day, do you have uh, any type of routine or habit or, you know, what kind of impact does just having a positive attitude to start your day change the course of your day and just within your own interactions with others and yourself? All right. Um, well, definitely positive mindset has a lot to do with it. But first, I think I'll explain to people one of the, one of the things that I use that helps me have a positive mindset. Um, 
and that is, is over the years from from being through many disappointments and setbacks and failures, uh, I've gotten pretty good at, uh, at at getting back up again. I tell people that uh, the people that are best at finding the positive are the ones who have been through a lot of negative, or the guys who are best at getting up are the ones who have spent a lot of time on their backside. I said the other word yesterday, and the podcast host wasn't happy with me. So, um, but <laughs> but 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 positivity, optimism, happiness—it starts with your decision. Are you are you going to decide to be positive and happy? Are you going? Are you going? Or are you deciding, or already have decided, to be negative and unhappy? Because a lot of times in life, it's not what happened to us; it's how we feel about it. And that's an old old saying from from guys who are much more famous and more respected than I am. So, but the truth is, what do you, what are you, what are you expecting? What did you decide to do when you got up that morning? So if you're, once you've made that decision that, that you know that there's something out there positive or something that's going to bring you happiness and joy, then you just have to keep looking for it until you find it. Or like I tell people, finding the, finding the positive in life, it's just like finding anything else. It's just like finding the TV remote. You know it's there somewhere, and you keep looking until you find it. You know, you may pull the, have to pull, put your couch cushions back when you're through. You may have to call your wife or your kids in to help you. But you know it's there somewhere, and you just keep looking. And that's the way it is when I get up in the morning. Uh, I know that at some point during my day, hopefully more than once, I'm going to meet a new person, either in person or online. I'm going to have an experience. I'm going to find an opportunity. Uh, something is going to happen to me or to one of the people in my circle of friends and family who I can take joy in something. And I'm, and I'm getting out of bed and I'm looking for it. I don't usually expect it to find it in my inbox. Although sometimes I'm surprised there, which is why I've, I really tried. I don't succeed, but I really try hard not to check my email first thing in the morning. I, because that's not usually a good place to find positive, happy stuff. I usually have to go through my junk mail and through the stuff that, I'll do later to, to find, to, to hopefully find something in there, but you know, find something in yourself, your family, your friends, your online community. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, fail to take joy in their friends, successes and accomplishments. Uh, there's a lot of jealousy and envy that, that keeps them from doing that. So that's my, that's, that's the thing is, is decide that it's there and look for it till you find it. And since I know this is going to happen, I approach every interaction with the expectation that something good is going to come up. And, you know, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes things don't go my way, but when they don't, if you, th if you think about it, sometimes I have to actually sit down and make a list for this. You can find something good that happened. Um, last year I went to New York city. To, I went to Philadelphia New York, and I was going to head on to Pittsburgh to give some, to give some talks. I was able to go and speak at PodFest in Orlando back in March because of that. I'm going to be going to Erie, Pennsylvania in October because of that. So uh, by, you know, by realizing that that wasn't a great thing and thinking, but yeah, Max, besides, besides, you know, making a new strategy that's working. Oh, by the way, Max, you spoke at WordCamp New York City. You know, you spoke at one of the two uh, biggest conferences in the country for people who are involved in WordPress. The only other one that's bigger is Nashville for some reason. They refer to it, they refer to it as WordCamp USA. So, you know, that was a positive. Um, I've got the video on my website. People, you know, I was able to share some, some great insights with those people. And at the, end of the, at the end of the hour, one of the guys that was an organizer of the event in the Q&A session, he admits, hey, I've been losing my vision. I've been hiding it for people. I haven't had the courage to admit that I have it or ask for help because of my, because of my, my talk that day with my voice about to go away from me and knowing that I don't have nowhere to stay that night. You know, it was a great experience seeing this guy admit something so important because with blindness, a lot of times it is accepting it and, and going from there. So you can find positives, even in, even in those worst experiences, but, I'll be honest, sometimes you have to sit down and make a list, a physical list, and sometimes you have to let your friends uh, remind you of the good things that came from that bad experience, which again goes back to having a community of people 
who will encourage and lift you up as opposed to say, yeah, you should have known better. Beautifully said, Max. I, I appreciate that honest remark because you really put into place of how, you know, you still need to experience these negatives and they're really stepping stones to move forward within your own triumphs, within your own goals and aspirations of your life. It really puts into place a, a good structure in terms of, you know, being aware as you are of both perspectives, of needing the the struggles in order to really maintain and and seek out those triumphs. And, you know, really speaking about that, when you had this transition of, you know, mindset of saying, you know, I'm going to show up every day and be, you know, and have a positive mindset or be the best version of myself as I can, was there any one person or a book or a movie that truly sparked the inspiration or motivation or, you know, was there to support you throughout this time to, to keep you in line of that mindset or was that all just a, a, a quick transition and you, and you held your, held yourself uh, up to that standard? Well, first I grew up in a, in a family of carnival owners and anybody that's out there that's involved in a, in a small business or a family owned business of any size knows that for the most part, you never have all the resources that you want or need. Um, some, some people may have may their finances may be great, but their, their staff may be horrible with us. We were, you know, we were, it was okay. What do we have to do to get open on Thursday? So somebody can ride the Ferris wheel and buy a cotton candy. And so it teaches you from an early age that really uh, nothing else matters as long as you get open, as long as you get to next week. So it, doesn't lend itself to a lot of, 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 of uh, self-absorption or, or, you know, of feeling sorry for yourself. But just, 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 you know, just from my, from my background, from, from the family, I, I had a good starting point. Um, I have read a lot of biographies and a lot of good self-help books. Um, and some of those were great as far as encouraged me, but a couple of them actually made it harder for me. And I think I should explain this because one of the things I think a lot of people get in trouble with, and I've had problems with it too, is comparing themselves to others. So I, you know, over the years I have read quite a few self-help books. Uh, at a while, for a while I read them because I, because uh, they were like uh, uh, like a booster shot, you know, continuing to to encourage you and maybe give you some ideas. Nowadays I read them just to see what the other people who write books are are, are doing, and occasionally I get surprised with some aha moments. Uh, but a couple of them, or a few that I read, were uh, Tom Sullivan's uh, "If You Can See What I Can Hear," uh, Rachel Skidoris, uh I don't know what the name of her book is, but it's about racing the Iditarod in Alaska. And then um, Eric Wehamir, which I didn't read "Touch the Top of the Skies" first. I read "Adversity Advantage" first, which, in my opinion, is a better book. Although, you know, everybody wants to hear the story about climbing Everest as a blind as a blind adventurer. So, but you know, these, those books were encouraging. They were like, you know, they reminded me that lots of possibilities are out there, but they also, when I started my blog, one of the things that kept me from starting it, from sharing it for, and one of the things that held me back with my book was these other blind people, they're doing stuff that makes what I'm doing look like nothing, you know? So why would people want to hear what I have to say? And it took a, quite, it took several of my friends to get me through that particular block but it did happen I was like you know so sometimes you can you can be inspired and sometimes you can be overwhelmed or uh, by by the people you're choosing to read and be encouraged from the words they happen to write in a in a book so that's and uh like I said adversity advantage by Eric Wehmeyer and uh we haven't scheduled a date yet but he has consented to be interviewed on my podcast and so any day, any, any time now, I'm going to record a podcast where I'm going to have to work really hard not to have a fanboy type moment during the interview. Um, but, you know, it just shows how, you know, comparison can get us into trouble. But those are some of the books. Uh, I generally, you know, like movies where, you know, the old kind of movies where sooner or later the, the, the hero, the underdog gets, gets their way. They, you know, they overcome things. Uh, so those are some of the movies, but I think a lot of it, you know, has to do with how I was raised, but the, the, I think a couple of the real important people, I mentioned Harlena Singh earlier, 
Um, the lady I call my blogging mama, her name is Adrienne Smith. She used to be known as the blog company superstar. She's not really online anymore, but I was blessed to know her. She taught me everything I know about relationship marketing, about how, you know, you can build friendships and relationships online through commenting on their blogs, sharing their content, reaching out to them in an email without asking them for anything, you know, just being helpful and supportive. And so she taught me so much. She was one of the first people she said, two things to me. She said, one, Max, I know that there's more in you than just selling carnival rides. And then she said, I know you don't think you're an inspiration, but I'm going to explain to you why you're an inspiration. And she was one of the, the one who was able, finally able to break through. She said, Max, there are so many people in this world who have no physical limitation or disability. There's nothing standing in the way from their, from their taking steps to go after any goal or dream they want to but they don't. Most of them, it's not a financial block. It's not uh, the family gets in the way. It's just they sleepwalk through their lives and, and don't do anything when they could. She said, the fact that you have the perfect excuse to sit at home, watch TV, and eat junk food if you wanted to is why you're inspiring. You could do nothing, and nobody would give you any problem about it. But the fact that you have this, this, this roadblock that makes everything you do harder and yet you show up every day and give it your best and just take the next step in front of you. She said, that's why you encourage, inspire, motivate us. And that's why you have to share your story. That, that really is beautifully said. I'm so glad you shared that because it, it truly is a, a testament to who you are. And, you know, you, you show up every day to connect with others, to share your own story, to help others share their story. And it really is, is a great example as to why you are inspiring many throughout, you know, your own relationships in person and your relationships within the online community. So it's truly incredible to have this connection with you, Max. And really, I think you're going to love this question. It's, it's the question that I ask my guests at the end of the interview to really encompass and wrap up their own life lessons, successes, stories, and, as you've already written three books, you're going to publish your fourth. And really this last question is to encompass if your whole life was, was to be put in this one book. And I want you to share one specific chapter that you think was a, a truly profound moment, lesson, or experience within your life that you want to leave the audience and give us a little glimpse into you know, why that was so inspiring or why it's a powerful message to leave my audience uh, to end this interview. Okay. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple of things just to make sure your audience is aware of them. Um, over the years, I, ha I have uh, been interviewed by many hosts and a few of them noticed on my profile that I like to sing. And so some of them started asking if I would sing live and I would do it. I enjoyed doing it. Uh, and the thing that surprises them is that I will sing live that it doesn't bother me or it doesn't appear to bother me when they find out that in junior high school, um, I, people would make fun of my singing. Uh, I was losing my vision, so I wasn't able to see as clearly as I'd like to. And it looked to me like the people who sang on television sang without their mouths moving. So I was trying to imitate those people. And I didn't realize why people were making fun of my, of my singing. I just, I would find out later why. So it's one of those things that um, over the years I've been self-conscious about, maybe even nervous about. And for a long time I didn't sing. But then when I, I started my, my, started recording videos, I needed to have some way of, of beginning. So I, uh, I, first time I sang a little bit from uh, Christmas Carol, Nat King Cole. And people liked it. They encouraged me to keep doing it. So I did more of it. And then when I started my podcast, you know, I would sing on the intro and the outro. And if it's, if it's appropriate, I'd do it during the show. So uh, th this, you know, is an example because in a lot of cases, people said, Max, why don't you try something? Or Max, why don't you do something? And I try it. I enjoy it. I, I continue to learn more about it and discover more about it and get better at it. And then eventually decide whether I want to keep doing it or not, or maybe I want to change the way I do it, like when I changed and only did, only did video for my podcast. So I, I like to refer to the song The River by Garth Brooks. You know, it's, it's all about how 
with my particular journey, it started 12 years ago when I filed for a domain name, not knowing how I was going to create or maintain a website, but I knew I had to start. So I did that one little thing, uh, started the website, the Midway Marketplace. Over the years, I've, I've had to learn so many things. Every time I learn something new, I realize, hey, Max, you're capable of learning it. You're capable of understanding it. Um, sometimes I decide to let other people do stuff because it's easier. But for the most part, every time I've tried something, whether it was successful or not so successful, it's made me more confident that I'm capable of doing other things. That, uh, you know, so just like a river winds, usually from a small source compared to its, its final, you know, uh, I'm told that where the Mississippi River starts, there are places where you can walk across it. But by the time it hits the Gulf of Mexico, it's this huge power of nature that even the National Corps of Engineers can't change or can't, can't make it move where it doesn't want to go. And that's been my, my progress. I've started from very small steps, not knowing what the heck was going to happen next, and continuing to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And the moment the, uh, was at uh, DreamCon three years ago, after the event is over with, everybody's taking pictures. I asked him, I said, do you mind if I, if I sing a little in front of this banner? Uh, it was after the conference. It's just the speakers. It's just coaches. It's, it's my people, as you would say. It shouldn't have made me nervous. But I did sing. My knees were shaking. I was having trouble with my breath. If you look at the video, the, the two guys standing next to me, they're not just standing next to me. They're holding me up which nobody could have done seven years ago when I weighed 600 pounds. Um, the way that affected me, and then when I'm through singing, this guy, Azuka, who's uh, one of those, you know, powerful coaches who sounds like he walked out of his mama's belly speaking. He's like, Max, your singing is amazing. It's an, it's an incredible or would be an incredible accompaniment to your talks. He said, from now on, if you talk, you have to sing. Promise me. Promise me, Max. Every time you talk from now on, you're going to sing. And he said, it will become your thing. It will be unique and memorable about you, even beyond the, all the other stuff that makes you unique and memorable. But he said, you know, event bookers, they like to have something that's, that's different. He said, but you combine the music with your message and your willingness to share both. He said, that would be amazing. And I actually sat down that same night and wrote a post about it because it did affect me. And I, I, uh, I think the post goes something like why the blind blogger sings and how he can help you free your own voice. I think that's the title of the post. So uh, continuing to take small steps, finding out more and more about myself as I go, uh, doing things that are scary and learning from them, whether they're good, bad, or otherwise, and just enjoying the experience, enjoying the, the journey from you know, whatever happens to be around that next bend in the river. Thank you so much for that honest, honest answer, Max, to, you know, what was a, I, I think truly a important, you know, message to share throughout your own life and that transition of how music is really bringing out the best in you. I, I'm so happy that we were able to speak today and you to be the 41st guest actually on the uh, Mental Insights podcast. It was <laughs> such a pleasure to speak with you. And, you know, I'm so grateful for you to take this time out with me. All right. Well, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the opportunity. And now that I'm glad that I don't number my podcast episodes, I just use the name of the guests. So I don't have to, I don't have to, I don't have to try to remember that one extra thing, but <laughs> let me, but let me make sure that I, I tell you, um, I, w I like to make sure I do this every time because for, for people who don't know this, the majority, vast majority of people who have a podcast are not doing it to get rich. That's not their goal. Most of them aren't making a lot of money from it, but, mo but most either have a passion for it, they enjoy it, they enjoy the energy that comes from conversations or the things they learn from having conversations, uh, or, or many of them do it because they feel like they have an obligation to give people like me a platform to share our stories and inspire and encourage other people. So uh, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity and giving the opportunity to so many other, other guests, as well as giving the opportunity for that one person that we might influence today who will decide to take one small step between, you know, now and the end of today. So without you, I wouldn't have this opportunity. So thank you very much. 
Thank you so much for that, Max. Those were such kind words, and I truly appreciate it. I can't wait to share this conversation with everyone out there to listen. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mental Insights Podcast. Please screenshot this episode and share any insights that you may have learned throughout this conversation. Please like, subscribe, and review the Mental Insights Podcast on whichever streaming platform you are listening on. I appreciate your support, and please share this amongst anyone who you believe should subscribe to the Mental Insights Podcast. Thank you all for listening. This has been your host, Brennan Catulli of the Mental Insights Podcast.